Okay, so we are going to talk about creating the digital image. So lots of discussion today about pixels and matrices and voxels and how many pixels do you have? There's a calculation for that. How big is the pixel? There's a calculation for that. Um, excellent, thank you. So uh, it's information like that. How many grayscales can a particular pixel represent? That's called the bit depth, we'll get to that. So a few things to go over. So here's a very simplified version of what a matrix would look like. Uh, the reality is you can't touch the matrix, they're just memory locations. We often demonstrate it, illustrate it so that we can kind of understand what's going on. Uh, but we, so we talk about it in terms of how many rows you have, how many columns you have, each box is a little pixel. The numbers in here represent uh, maybe a particular row and a particular uh, brightness level. Uh, doesn't really matter what's, what's up here just yet. The point is that each pixel has to get a certain brightness level, right? And we'll talk about how that is determined. The system can only produce a certain number of grayscales, brightness levels. We'll talk about that. Uh, but they all have to show up on these pixels, which are really memory locations within your computer somewhere that are assigned a particular brightness level, right? And there has to be a little bit of reconstruction and a little bit of mathematical algorithms going on to figure out just what one of those pixels uh, brightness levels will be. And there are lots and lots of pixels, right? And we'll talk about that next. So far, so good? So here's another example of some pixels that live on this matrix, not the movie matrix, the screen matrix. Pixels are all over the place, right? You have pixels on your phones, you have pixels on, uh, on your, all your other devices and screens. Um, but today we're talking specifically about monitors used in radiology, um, not just limited to radiography, but MR, CT, I guess technically anything else like ultrasound, nuclear medicine. And each pixel is known as a picture element. That's just a quick definition. Um, a large matrix would mean more and more pixels. So in order to get more pixels, you need more rows and more columns, which you might also think that's going to mean more mathematical processes going into the brightness level of each one more memory, more computing power. So, you know, the bigger your matrix sizes, uh, the better your spatial resolution usually, but the price to pay is time and computing power and memory usage. So what's a typical matrix? Uh, in radiography, they're usually larger than this, right? So they double. So you have 512 by 512, which is twice as much as 256 by 256, the next one would be 1024, and so on. It goes somewhere around up to 4096. You have some of the highest matrix sizes in digital radiography, more than CT, more than, much more than MRI, actually. Um, there are some downsides, though, in radiography that we'll get to uh, in a minute. These numbers that you see laid out here, they are representative of different grayscales. So for example, you know, if the numbers are the same, the grayscale should be the same. Um, how do we figure out how many pixels there are? Is we multiply the columns by the rows. And guess what? We don't have to think about which is the column and which is the row because the numbers in digital radiography are always the same. Whereas you can have rectangles in MRI, meaning that one of the numbers would be different. Let's say one, 256 by 512 would give you a rectangle because you have more rows than columns or the other way around. Uh, but in this case, we don't have to think about it. Uh, so how many pixels do we have? Someone do the math, 512 times 512. Don't you know it's like 262,153? <laughs> uh, actually, I forget what it was. Um, it was... What was it, 512 times 512? Uh, 262, 144. 
because I've done this a hundred times. Um, okay, so that's your, your first question out of the way. If you're asked what, uh, how many pixels are on this matrix, you need to know what the matrix size is, uh, and then you'll be able to know how many actual pixels there are. Okie doke. That's pretty easy, right? We start off easy, just multiply two numbers together. Whoops. Uh, so, very important is spatial resolution is affected by several different factors. One of them is pixel size. Not how many pixels you have, really, but pixel size. And the reason I say really in that kind of way is Generally speaking, when you go to a larger matrix, you do have more pixels, that part is for sure, but very common that they do get smaller. But that's not always the case. That's only the case if your field of view remains the same. Time for an illustration. So, if you have, maybe I'll fix this up a little bit so we kind of start at the beginning. If you have a matrix, this would be a four by four matrix, 16 pixels all together. The field of view or FOV is the border, field of view. If the field of view doesn't change and you go to a larger matrix size, like so, what happens? Field of view is the same, but pixels. Field of view remains the same, constant, more pixels, but they're smaller. Key component to that is they're smaller. In terms of spatial resolution, that means you can resolve smaller objects, right? And the rule goes as follows. You can only resolve an object that is the same size or larger than the pixel diameter actually is, right? So if the pixel is 0.4 millimeters, then you can resolve an object that's half a millimeter, right, 0.5. But if it's only a, a tiny, tiny little 1.1 millimeter object and you have a 0.4 millimeter pixel, not happening. Of course, it's not happening in either of those cases anyway because we're restricted by our focal spot from last week. But if the question is just related to pixels, right? Because we could talk about pixels on your, on your megapixel, like cool iPhone without talking about focal spots at all, right? So pixels are a universal term um, for screens that luckily your iPhones aren't influenced by focal spot size. So we're clear, right? If the object is smaller than the pixel, can't see it. It's gonna be blue. Excuse me? It's gonna be blue. It's gonna be blurry. blurry. blurry? No, you just really won't notice it, right? It kind of blends. So remember, the pixels are tiny, right? Um, so a lot of times you might not notice it anyway. But uh, the, the theory is you can't resolve an object that's smaller than the ability to display objects based on pixel size. So how can we measure pixel size? We've talked about this before. Um, we utilize line pairs per millimeter. And the idea in ABC is we have more and more line pairs per millimeter as we're going from left to right. So the best spatial resolution is C. It does look more sharp, right? So spatial resolution is often looked at, you know, going from blurry to more and more sharp of an image. You know? So, you know, would I be able to see her strand of hair? This is kind of like your question. It's there, we didn't, you know, lose her hair, but it, it's kind of hard to, to pull it out at this point. 
what if the object is uh, bigger than uh, the pixel size? Okay. So then multiple pixels take over and you should be able to demonstrate it. I mean, there are other reasons why you can't see it, you know, like the focal spot, like the dynamic range that we'll talk about later on. Um, but the, the idea at, at this level, I just want you to understand smaller pixels, better spatial resolution, and, and it's the resolving ability of the system. Okay. So here's some examples, right? Um, an object here, right, on number six to the right, um, if we have 10 objects in here, we might not be able to see them, you know, uh, because they'll all kind of stick together. But if we have 10 objects, you know, uh, in, in these where the spatial resolution line pairs per millimeter are higher, we might be able to separate them out. Uh, so the smaller, uh, not the smaller, the larger your line pairs, right? The more line pairs that you have within a millimeter, which is kind of hard to phantom to begin with, right? You, we talked about this last week. You take that one little millimeter and then try to draw lines in between the beginning and end of that one millimeter space, you know, so uh, pretty good to begin with. Uh, our pixels on average are around, you know, 0.3 millimeters, so they're, they're pretty small. I mean, after all, how are you going to get 262, 143, was it? 144. You guys wrote that down? Okay. 144. 144. You know, how, how are you supposed to get all those, you know, on a screen? They have to be pretty small, right? On average, uh, we're talking about six to eight line pairs. Remember, the line there is the line and the space between the next line. Is, is the definition. So if you can visualize the space, if you can visualize six to eight spaces between, you know, the beginning of one millimeter and the end of another, that's pretty good. Yes. So as you said the larger one pair within the millimeter, you didn't finish it. Oh, the, the more, so, so lar larger is not the best word. More line pairs per millimeter, higher spatial resolution better ability to resolve smaller and smaller objects. And if that's an object that's a naughty, naughty pathological object, then that's a good thing if you can see it. If you don't see it, then you get a radiographic study that's negative, everyone seems happy until maybe something continues to grow inside of someone. Not good. So. And that sounds like, how could you miss anything that's that good? We're talking, I mean, that's, that looks, you know, when you first look at it, it's like really good. But things start at a cellular level, right? And, you know, you can catch things that are so small that aren't even captured on uh, an X-ray or MR or CT. That's even better. That's where the, the field of nuclear medicine comes in. Right, that can see things at those going towards the molecular level, not atomic. That would be even better, but we're not even close to that. So we figured out how many pixels there are. How big are they? Well, we said on average they might be about you know 0.3 or so, but how do you figure it out? Yes, ma'am. average is 0.3, but what's the smallest? Because 0.3, you cannot put more than three lines in millimeter. So if it's smaller than that, you're not going to see it. So I don't know exactly what the world record is in, in radiography, right? And, you know, it depends uh, how small pixels can get. So maybe we can Google that and find out. But... Um, yeah, it's pretty small. I mean, excuse me? Uh, the, the, the field of view is going to affect things as well. And actually, we're going to talk about that in just a second. So if you need to find out what the pixel size actually is, which you wouldn't, of course, do on a daily basis, right? But, you know, we're talking theoretical and you need to learn all sorts of things for that exam that you'll take one day. In any case, 
you have to do everything in millimeters first. And it's very common that they don't give you the information that you need in millimeters and you have to first figure it out. So you may get a question similar to this one here. What's the pixel size? Because that's what we're talking about. If you had a 12 by 12 digital images, it's 12 inches, um, at a display screen and the field, uh, excuse me, and the matrix size, right? The field of view is 12. The matrix size is 1024. Now, if we wanted to figure out how many pixels, we would multiply those two together, which we said earlier. But if you want to find out how big each individual pixel is, the formula is field of view divided by matrix. First, though, we have to take those 12 inches and convert it to millimeters. So the conversion from inches to millimeters is 25.4. So there's 25.4 millimeters in each inch. Inch, you know, you can try it at home. Take your ruler and try to figure it out. Uh, but it's been done for us. So what do we do? We multiply the 12 or whatever the question's asking, you know, whatever they give you for the field of view. And we get 305 millimeters. We divide that by the matrix, but very important. Don't multiply these two together and then divide it in, right? We're not gonna divide this by some 5 million mark. Um, we are going to just take the first number Feel free to take the second one, it's the same anyway. Take 1024, divide that into 305, and we get a pixel that's you know almost 0.3 millimeters, you know, technically 0.298. By the way, the numbers aren't always the same for your matrix. In MRI, you can get rectangles. In other words, that would translate to a different number of columns versus a different number of rows. But in radiography and CAT scan, it's all square. Right, rows equal columns. If it's a rectangular, then we have to multiply the rows and columns, then or not, and then divide by them. Well, you don't have to worry about that now, right? Because um, luckily in CT MR, we don't have to worry about that. Uh, in in but in MRI, we multi we would divide by the number of phase lines, which is the first number anyway. Um, okay. So now we know how many and how big they are. So again, if the object's half a millimeter, we can see it. If the object's less than 0.3, we cannot resolve an object that small. Now, if the field of view changes, that will change our spatial resolution. So it doesn't exactly work this way. I will explain it more in depth. But the way for today, you can think about when the field of view changes. So we're talking about the border again. And now we have a larger field of view. Right? You can look at it as the pixels stretching out and getting bigger. Thus, if your field of view goes up and your pixels get bigger, then your spatial resolution goes down. Not as good. Do pixels actually stretch? No, they don't. Okay. To get into it for just a second, because I just can't help myself, is the pixels are reconstructed and looked at mathematically in a different way, right? They're, they're looked at in different types of groupings, right? So it's not like they stretch, but the, the math in the background is, is done differently, right? Say, say one more time. Uh, I'm not sure I understand your question exactly. Um, but in the reconstruction process, uh, when you when you do things like magnification of an image, which we'll talk about, uh, it's not that the, the pixels change, it's that the computer will, you know, look, instead of looking at five pixels at a time, 
it'll look at 20 pixels at a time, right? Uh, and, and do different calculations on different sort of groupings or subsets of pixels. But let's not go there right yet. Yeah, even though I started. Can you repeat that whole if your field of view changes, increases? So think about it this way. If your field of view increases, and it's the opposite as well too, think about it as your pixels stretching out, getting bigger. And then if you have bigger pixels, that means you can't resolve smaller objects. Right, your spatial resolution goes down. So that brings us to magnification, which is really Well, no, let's not talk about magnification per se. Let's just say if the pixels get bigger, because they just either are bigger or you change your field of view and make it bigger so that they kind of stretch out, then your spatial resolution, the sharpness of the image, goes down. If the field of view getting smaller, then the sharpness is better. So you would look at it as uh, the pixels being smaller, more compressed spatial resolution. In that case, goes up. So we can see better when the field of view is smaller. You would see better with a field of view uh, being smaller, right? But but you might not be able to scan as much coverage, as much anatomy. Yeah. So if your field of view gets bigger, does your matrix size get bigger? Or would so it, 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 it would. So no. Um, if if your field of view gets bigger and they stretch out, you know, in theory, the so the theory, because I didn't really want to get exactly into that. Stretching out just helps people understand whether you know, and and pretends that the pixel gets bigger or larger. The number of pixels never actually changes. Right. Uh, it's just how they are processed that changes. Okay. Francine, you had something? Yeah, I was going to say so. Field of view doesn't change, then it will get sharper. But if it increases or decreases, then it will affect the image. So if the field of view remains the same, simply going to a larger matrix means you'll have more and smaller pixels and spatial resolution will increase. Right. Field of view, you take the number of pixels that you have there. And then just think about it from the perspective of whether they're getting kind of stretched out if the field of view increases or compressed if the field of view goes down. And, and here was the math, you know, which we kind of did already, right? Formula is field of view divided by matrix. Just remember you have to convert to millimeters if you are given inches or if you're giving centimeters for that matter. So spatial frequency, we touched upon this last week. Um, the spatial frequency, which will be given in line pairs, can also be figured out if you divide the pixel size multiplied by two first. So multiply the pixel size by two, divide it into one, that gives us our spatial frequency. Last week, or maybe the week before, um, we saw spatial frequency. It was here, and it was related to um, trying to figure out the minimum object size that can could be resolved by the system. So we started discussing spatial resolution a little bit, and we said that we would one divided by the spatial frequency, and then multiply that by 0.5 or one half to give us a minimum object size. So this slide here, number 38, lecture three, is related to lecture five, slide eight, for reference. And it could end up being a two-part problem, right, because you may need to you may be given pixel size, you may be given space or frequency, and you can figure out one over the other. So how do our pixels demonstrate a brightness level? Where's this brightness level coming from? Well, the grayscale, because it is a grayscale, I mean, it might be white, which is not really that gray. It might be black, that's, I guess, as dark of a gray as you can get. 
But usually we don't talk about extremes. We talk about something in between. Where's it coming from? It's coming from the tissues, but exactly where? You have to think of the body as a bunch of little cubes in reality, right? And each cube has a bunch of tissues in it, depending on you know, how big the cubes are. And the cubes are called voxels or volume elements. But it comes down to attenuation of the radiation beam that we talked about last year in our first few classes. We talked about the fact that one tissue absorbs radiation more or less than another tissue. Simple as that. It's simple as the intensity of radiation that you start with will be different from the intensity of the radiation that you end with. And that number changes depending on what tissues you're going through. And it's never just one tissue. It's always an average of the tissues. It's the average of the tissues that end up in one voxel. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Uh, of course, we've already learned, though, that the more radiation, the more attenuation that happens, the lighter that particular pixel will be which is why bone absorbs a lot of radiation, shows up much brighter, much wider than soft tissue. So the pixel we've talked about, the voxel, I don't think we've touched upon exactly. They are combined, really. You can't have a pixel without a voxel, and you can't have a voxel without the front of the voxel, which is really the pixel. So the pixel is the element of depth, right? It's the third dimension. On a screen, you don't see it. You just see the pixels. A voxel, I use the analogy, it's kind of like a sugar cube, right? And if I took the sugar cube and put it right up to your eye so that you couldn't see how thick the sugar cube was, you just saw this kind of like white square, that would be the pixel, right? So if we wanted, we could relabel this and say the dark aspect of this cube is the pixel, but the whole cubic aspect of it is the voxel. So in an, any image, if we have 262,144 pixels, then we have that same number of voxels, right? They're inseparable. Now, in CAT scan and MRI, we can change the size of the voxel, make it bigger or smaller, and that's the same thing as changing our slice thickness. But in x-ray, we don't do that. Essentially, we still have voxels, but, one, but we have gigantic voxels. We have one big gigantic slice, right? When we take an AP or KUB, it's just one long voxel. It looks something like this. Here's your pixels, but they're really attached to a voxel. And captured in each voxel is all sorts of anatomy. So what is it, to get back to what we were saying, what is it that gives the pixel its brightness level? The brightness level of the pixel is determined by the average attenuation of all of the tissues that are trapped in one voxel. You guys okay with that? Mm -hmm. right, you, have, you have all these different voxels, but they all have a bunch of tissues in them. All those tissues, if you looked at them individually, would have different attenuation coefficients based on how much radiation they absorb. But you're only allowed one brightness level one particular grayscale for every pixel. And that's determined by how many different attenuation coefficients are in a voxel. They average those all together and then give you a brightness. I didn't mention it to the last class, but I guess they can watch this video. And 
technically sometimes things go wrong, right? Sometimes if you have very, very different types of tissues that individually would give you very different grayscales, they get averaged together and you don't get a good grayscale that represents either one, right? And it causes an artifact known as partial volume artifacts, which I don't think I cover on, on any particular exam. So it's not a perfect process. Yes. So the brightness is determined by all the attenuation and the coefficients in that voxel, but it's portrayed That's right. in the pixel. Excuse me? It's portrayed in the pixel. Yes. So, right, each, I mean, think of it, if you don't want to think about it as like, a, you know, the square going down, like we saw before, you know, think about it as, you know, uh, a, a cylinder. Right, filled with different tissues. Each individual tissue has a different attenuation based on how it absorbs the radiation. In a perfect world, if you had a cylinder that had just you know one tissue type in it, you would get just one attenuation, which would be linked to one brightness level. But now you have 10, let's say. So you take all of the attenuation coefficients, all 10 of them, average them together, and that becomes the brightness of the pixel, which could vary. <coughs> excuse me, if you were able to control the size of your voxel and have different slice thicknesses. But in, in x-ray, you can't. And that's actually, I'm glad you asked this, and I kind of went on this tangent a little bit. That's one of the rationales for why the contrast resolution is so much better in CT and MRI, because it's more reflective of a, a lower number of tissues per voxel. My daughter said I should monetize the videos. I was like, what? <clears throat> okay. Now, we talked about kind of how the brightness comes about. How many potential brightness levels can any individual pixel represent? That is based on something known as the bit, B-I-T, depth, D-E-P-T-H. And bit depth always starts with the number two, not two grayscales, but a base number of two. And then if the bit depth is given to you, which it would be in our problems, and it would be if you were trying to buy a machine, like a, uh, like a monitor, and you wanted to know like how many potential grayscales any individual pixel could represent, you would take the space of two, and if they told you the bit depth was six, you would say two to the sixth power, two times two times two, times two times two times two, I think I did that right. You can check the video and see if I counted. Would give you 64. What it means is in this example, you have 64 potential grayscales. They always start the same though. They always start with you know black on one side, white on the other, and I guess another 62 grays in between. So if the bit depth increases, key point, you can potentially have higher contrast, right? And you may be able to demonstrate more different tissue types. One of the problems that you have is, in, especially in x-ray, is you can't distinguish one tissue from another. It just kind of gets lumped in as soft tissue. It's kind of hard to see. Other modalities do a much better job, as you'll see next year when you have cross-sectional anatomy and you're asked to label, you know, an axial abdominal view, and you find yourself drawing arrow after arrow after arrow because you can see so many different things. Try that with a regular diagnostic KUB, and you could label like four things. The big difference. <clears throat> What's interesting, though, is let's say this bit depth was high. Of course, the number would go up. Let's say it's all of a sudden 200 grayscales or 300 grayscales. We are restricted because we are human. Our eyes can, on average, you know, everyone might be a little bit different, but on average, we can visualize around 32 shades of gray. No 50 shades of gray jokes, please. <laughs> right? 32 shades of gray. But 
The computer knows every single one of them. Think about it, it has a special number and a particular memory location. You know, the field is going towards artificial intelligence. The, the physician, radiologist, may not be able to distinguish something that's right in front of them. And can't blame them, it's just human. But the computer can't. And the computer could say, you know what, this is not, you know, on average, normal. Maybe you should look closer. And it might help you with the diagnosis, computer-aided diagnosis, or CAD. is out there. It's common. People are not going into radiology anymore, physician-wise. They're worried, like truck drivers and automated trucks. Luckily, they haven't, you know, the AI hasn't gotten good enough and the robots are not good enough to, like, do a lateral oblique elbow. So I think our jobs are safe. So, right, so here are all those voxels. You have as many voxels as pixels. Just in case I didn't mention it, a voxel actually stands for volume element versus picture element. And it's really just the average of the attenuations that get stuck in that voxel. Question? So far, so good? So we were talking about specific pixels. And that might, so bit depth might be something that you think about when you buy a home or when you buy a $30,000, $40,000 monitor that radiologists use. Yeah, they're that expensive, they're 5K. I used to say 4K. Um, but we need to kind of look beyond the pixel and talk about how well can the components of the entire system, the computer, the hardware, the software, the equipment, all of that stuff, and the pixel based on bit depth, but overall, how well can the system display grayscales? So there is a similarity to each other and it can be a little bit confusing. The larger aspect of this is known as dynamic range. The higher the dynamic range, the better. The more or higher the dynamic range, which we said is based on everything, software, hardware, equipment, etc., is also based on two to the power of whatever the dynamic range is. Uh, so in this example, right, you might have a 14-bit dynamic range. And we figure it out the same way as we did bit depth. It would be two to the 14th power. I did the math in the last class with the calculator. It really does come up to 16,384. I know it might be hard to see back there, shades of gray. Of course, the physical aspect of us still remains the same. We're still stuck around 30 something grayscales that we can actually see, literally. I mean, think about it. Dynamic range is one number, includes the bit depth, but then the overall dynamic range will change if you pop in a different monitor, right? Like if I go from my sort of cheap Samsung to like an S Samsung, then, then I probably have like a better overall dynamic range. But I'm pretty happy with that. Yeah, I mean, is that overkill? Two to the 12th power, 4,096 different grayscales? So these are extreme examples, right? We can all tell that the image of, I think this is a moth of some sort, and the upper left-hand corner is pretty horrible because it has like a bit depth of one. So two to the power of one is two. So how many grayscales do you have? Two. Not that good for contrast, right? A whole lot of stuff gets missed. Either it gets lumped in with the white stuff or it gets lumped in with the black stuff. You can't really define one piece of something versus another, except in the most macro of ways. Whereas down here, 
Uh, I think in this example, we have, it's, it's hard to see, even on my screen, it came out a little bit bad here. It's two to the eighth power, which is 256 grayscales. That allows us to see much more detail. I never did turn off the lights in here, but I hope you can understand the concept without me turning the lights off. So our scale of contrast is directly affected by dynamic range. When the dynamic range goes up, the scale of contrast goes up. Whether we can see with our eyes, different story. And here's an issue. You probably don't think about it. Guaranteed techs don't think about it. They don't really have to. Someone does. Maybe IT does. There's a lot of memory, a lot of storage necessary for digital images. You know, CAT scans like off the chart. There's so much image data collected and then reconstructed. Radiology, not so much. Radiographic image is about maybe five minutes. But they add up. And every time you want to do something special to them, it keeps adding to the data and more memory required. So in terms of what we're talking about today, uh, if you have a higher dynamic range and you actually want to display uh, as much grayscale as you can, you're going to use more memory. So the bit depth times the matrix size, so larger matrixes, more pixels, remember there's a little logic, a little memory has to go into each one, is going to create more data, which requires more memory storage. Not to mention, I didn't mention this in the last group either, you probably learned this in one of your classes, maybe patient care, you have to keep this stuff around for a while. You can't just delete things next week. Right? You have to keep a record, I was it, seven years, if, 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 unless things have changed. We didn't talk about what's that? Isn't it in a box system they have special like storage? Yeah, they have to keep adding storage, and and some institutions may keep things, you know, longer than seven years. But I think in New York, or I'm not even sure if it's a national law, you have to keep this stuff for around seven years, if not longer. Yeah. Uh, but then it gets more complicated in, in MRI and CT. Do you keep the image data? Do you keep the raw data? Do you keep, you know, there's different types of data classifications that we'll get into in another class. It gets a little bit fuzzy. Film was easy. You kept the film. That was it. it you know, that was it. Just put it in a box somewhere. But still, in seven years, you have to show. No. I, I think you were allowed to. Well, yeah. I mean, there's a whole history, and I remember this history, where where people used to get off-site storage because they had so much plastic film to deal with. But now they need, you know, it's, it's not as bad, but now you still need servers. You still need, you know, physical space somewhere. And now, not only that, you have to back it up, which we talk about in yet another class. Right, we'll talk about RAID, not the bug spray. Uh, random array of uh, independent disks is a common storage device. So you have to double everything, depending on whether you compress it or not. But let's not even get into that. Um, so yeah, it starts to add up. Now, in terms of contrast, there are some things we can do to increase or make our contrast better, right? You're all familiar now where the DR image comes up and it looks kind of gray and washed out, and then it blinks and all of a sudden the contrast is better. It, turns, it like jumps out at you. So that's a whole topic that we're going to kind of start a little bit today and get into more specifics later on. But the systems have the ability to enhance your contrast. A lot of that is based on the particular procedural algorithm that you choose. Right? When you go to the CR system or the DR system and you say that you're doing an ankle, so you pick ankle. You don't say that you're doing a T-spine and then do a hand. Because then the contrast enhancement might not work correctly. And the idea is, if you look at this example, they took image A, which has a dark surrounded by three grays. And it's not the best example, honestly. I would have drew them like much closer so that you could almost not tell them apart. Because what they're trying to say in B, 
is they made this lower left-hand corner either darker or the same, made the other three much lighter so that you could really tell them apart. So the contrast is much higher and it jumps out of you, at you in B than in A. That's the idea, right? And we've gotten to a point, I'm a little bit skeptical. I, I hope it's not a typo on my part. I'm not sure we can distinguish differences that low, right? A 1% difference is the tissue from one tissue to the next. Like my two fingers together vary by just 1%, and then I can actually have one grayscale for one finger and a different grayscale for the other. Right? I don't think it's that good. I remember talking about 10% and CAT scan being up you know, closer to 1%. I have to double check. You have the book right there? Or you're studying for that other class? Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell because my book has a little bit down to it. <laughs> Got some good dynamic range in my textbook. All right. So, you know, like I was saying, the whole, one of the rationales is there's a different bit of math involved in each procedure in order to try to tweak and change the contrast that's best suited for shoulder if that's what you pick. So you really shouldn't, you know, do a shoulder and then pick a foot. Does it sometimes actually come out better when you do that? Yeah, so that's why people do it sometimes. It's not a perfect science. They're still trying to improve these things. You know, but really you shouldn't just start doing whatever you feel like just because you think it's better. Right, we talked about that in the lab last week. All right, you're not supposed to make these kind of individual. Now, what you can do is you can bring it to a staff meeting and you can say, hey, we noticed that when we, you know, provided you don't get fired on the spot for saying that, that when we pick this procedural algorithm, but we do this completely different exam, everything looks great. And better than if we use the actual procedural algorithm, maybe someone will listen to you. Maybe they'll come and they'll calibrate it. I know that our system uh, has been upgraded with newer software and everything gets better. It gets more detailed. I may have mentioned this in the lab. We used to have like one button. It quite honestly was easier. If we did upper extremity, it counted for finger, hand, wrist, forearm, etc. Now you actually have to pick either a wrist or a forearm or, you know. Uh, and the idea is, is the contrast is supposed to be better when you do that. Now, let's say you don't like what comes out. So the system goes through a process that we'll talk more detailed about in another class, but you don't like the process. You want to change it yourself. This is known as windowing. We've talked a little bit about this before. You have the ability to essentially say, I don't like the contrast that you gave me. I'm going to try to fix it myself manually. But it ends up going through the same procedure. You're just initiating it. So when you want to change the contrast, you manipulate what's known as the window width. And that's going to, like an accordion, it's going to change the size of our, our grayscale, right? Longer, more grays, shorter, less grays. Hi. Siri, pause that.
So where were we? So the other half of manipulating the image, if you don't like the contrast, or if you like it, that's nice. You can also adjust the brightness. And when we adjust the brightness, we can't just say adjust the brightness, we have to call it adjusting the window level. So level means brightness. Uh, and when we go to a higher window level, that means a darker image, which you'll see on the next slide. Excuse me? So window length or window level, I use those two words synonymously, would be the brightness of the image. And usually uh, the default window level is the center of the window width. So let me explain that, what, what that means. So if we go back to, where did I have it? Here. The window width is this entire thing, right? Which changes how many grayscales you possibly display. The window level is usually the middle of the window width. And each one of these boxes has a number. So I'll, I'll use CAT scan as an example. CAT scan typically has a window width of 2,000. It goes from negative 1,000 up to zero, and then from zero up to positive 1,000 for a total of 2,000 different grayscales, potentially. So the window level is zero. And, and the window level zero generally represents water. Water? Water. Bone is at the top, air is at the bottom. Like negative 1,000 is usually air. So how do we adjust the window width or the window length slash level uh, is with the mouse. Usually when you go up and down vertically with the mouse, you might be adjusting the contrast, the window width. Uh, and then when you go horizontally left to right, you might be adjusting the window level, which would be the brightness. It might be reversed. You know, I can't say every system is the same. All I can say is when you move the mouse diagonally, people get upset at you, right? Because that means you're really cool. You can adjust the brightness and the level at the same time. That's like the floating tabletop that you can just kind of put where you want, you know, versus you have one button that moves it one way and another button that moves it down, you know, you, some people might say that when you use one button at a time, you have more control. Other people might say, well, I can move the table wherever I want, and I'm really that good. You know, I don't have to go through as many steps. Uh, alternatively, window width and window level uh, can be, you know, plugged in if you really know your numbers. Right? And we've seen this in the lab. But here's an example. We're going from a window level of 40 to 400, just like 10 times darker, right, when we do that. And don't say that this is now high contrast. It's just that we can't see the contrast now because we've made it so dark, right? So it's kind of like hiding there. Uh, so window level, usually abbreviated WL, sometimes just known as the level. Uh, and it's the center point of the entire grayscale. And as I've said, strictly speaking, it increases or decreases the brightness of the overall image. Uh, there are some systems that might allow you to choose a region of interest and then change it in just one spot. 
I mean, almost anything you can think of has been done somehow. And where does this stuff all end up? The downside is nowadays in the digital world is it usually ends up on a much better monitor than the one you're looking at <clears throat> when you create the image. What do you have? Something that might be the size of this you know, vanilla envelope or maybe even half the size or a small computer screen that's just you know, nothing special like a Dell. Although this is a nice screen, this is not one of these 5K Seriously, around $30,000 monitors. I am upset with this. I've gotten over it. I don't really lose any sleep, but I remember the day not that long ago when the piece of plastic that came out of the processor was exactly what everyone else, everyone looked at the same exact thing. Now there's a little bit of a disconnect. And part of that is relevant. I'm not just saying that to be nostalgic. It's relevant because now when we manipulate the image, which we really should do, on our sub-superior or basically inferior monitors, how do we know what that effect will do when it's transferred over and viewed on a much better monitor? We don't really. So the rule is you're not really supposed to mess with things too much. Let them window and level. Because they can, of course, they can do that stuff. Anything we can do, I shouldn't say they can do that, <laughs> right? Uh, they can with their monitors anyway, right? They, they definitely have, you know, more expensive monitors. We have the cool equipment, but they have some cool monitors. Um, so uh, it all ends up here. Uh, we'll talk not too much about workstations and display stations, but the workstation part means they can do all sorts of fancy reconstructions. They can see things in different windows. They can uh, essentially have three different contrast levels and display all three at the same time. You can only look at it and change it from one thing to the other, right? They can you know, change it, freeze it, give it a window, change it, freeze it, put it in another window, do all sorts of fun stuff, right? CT and MRI is even more fun because they can you know, do 3D models and spin things around and do all sorts of fancy magazine stuff, but uh, it's not quite what we can do. So I miss them having film, but I recognize the digital capabilities of being able to make a better diagnosis when you can actually change the contrast and you aren't left with KV deciding what the contrast is going to be. So I'll leave you with that. Any questions? No? All right. See you in a week and some of you this afternoon maybe or either the last class, I don't remember.